everyone. Here are our announcements this week at First Baptist Church. The first announcement is this. If you got something at the silent auction in the FLC, make sure you stop by there and pick it up. The doors will be unlocked after each services, so make sure you stop by there and pick it up. Because if you don't, well, I have some ideas of what we could do with it. But anyway, make sure you stop by there, get the stuff that you bid on. I got a few other announcements that are for February 11th. That Sunday, Sunday morning, immediately following the second service, is our Deacons Acts 6 luncheon. That is for our senior adult, widows and widowers. So make sure that you RSVP by calling the office and letting us know that you plan on attending that luncheon. And also on February 11th, that night at 6 p.m., we'll have our Big Game Fellowship. We'll be having wings and other snacks as we watch the Big Game that kicks off at 6.30. So meet in the student building at 6 p.m. That is a great night for fun and fellowship together as we all watch the game together. That is all of my announcements right now, but make sure you read the bulletin for anything else that I might not have covered. Good morning. We want to welcome you to First Baptist Church. We're so glad that you're here today in the building or watching online and worshiping with us. And uh, we want to kind of frame our worship this morning. We're going to sing the hymn, Heaven Came Down and Glory Filled My Soul. And it just gives us an opportunity to think back upon that time which, when we learned of God's forgiveness and the salvation that is available to us through Jesus Christ. Uh, Psalm 51 12 says this restore to me the joy of your salvation and make me willing to obey you then I will teach your ways to rebels and they will return to you forgive me for my sin O God who saves then I will joyfully sing of your forgiveness unseal my lips O Lord that my mouth may praise you one of the best best ways to to uh, sing with great joy and gratitude when we worship is to think back to the time when we got saved and the challenge for some of us is we've been saved so long we've gotten so used to it it just doesn't seem that special anymore you know what I mean we kind of get into a routine of going to church and doing things and it's good but sometimes we almost take for granted and so it's always good to look back and remember what the Lord has done for each one of us. And so as we sing these songs today, I pray that you'll have a chance to look back and reflect on the goodness of the Lord, His greatness to us, His faithfulness, His mercy, His grace, His love for each one of us. Let's stand. We're going to sing, Heaven Came Down and Glory Filled My Soul.
Thank you. That second song we sung, All in All, uh, as we were singing it, I remember where I learned that song. And it's funny how, our, how powerful our, our minds can be where we remember where we were the first time we heard something or maybe a sermon that, that God used in a powerful way. But I remember I was at summer camp when I learned that song. And uh, so as we were singing it, Don, thank you. It brought back some incredible memories. And all I got to say is my poor youth pastor. <laughs> oh, man. <clears throat> and, uh, well, not since then, but just, I just want to say this. I've been a work in progress, and I still, and I still am. But uh, to give up, I like what the words say, to give up, I'll be a fool. And... Uh, Jim Elliott, I think he's, he's the one that said, he is no fool, he gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. And y'all, we are no fools. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. The world may think we're fools, but we're not fools. Uh, we're seeking after a precious jewel, and uh, that is Jesus Christ. Uh, this morning... Uh, we're in for a treat, as we are every week, uh, but preaching this morning, it will be Pastor Jeff Lawson. Uh, he'll be bringing the word. Uh, so uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer and lift him up this morning and just pray that, uh, man, just a powerful wind of the Holy Spirit would blow through here. Um, Y'all, we could meet, we could read God's word, but without the power of the Holy Spirit, uh, we would leave in vain. And so let's just pray that the, the, the Holy Spirit would come and meet us where we're at um, and speak to us, uh, convict us, encourage us, and so that we will leave more like Jesus Christ and live for Him uh, this week. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. We thank you for uh, forgiveness. As we sung in that first song, Lord, the forgiveness. God, we thank you Lord, for being our precious jewel as we sung in our second song. And God, we, we thank you for the happiness that we have. We sing because we are happy. And we are happy because we have been forgiven. You have saved us from our sin. You came and lived a life that we couldn't, died the death that we deserved. And uh, Lord, and thank you for the Holy Spirit that now lives inside of us. Lord, we pray for Pastor Jeff this morning. We ask that, Lord, that uh, we would see the power of the Holy Spirit speaking through him. Uh, Lord, use him in a mighty way. God, be his tongue, be his mind. I pray that your word would be a double-edged sword into our lives this morning. That, God, that you would cut us and, and heal us. That you would uh, change us this morning. That we would leave different this morning. Uh, God, use this word to... Uh, just do a mighty work in our lives. Uh, thank you for Pastor Brett and Pastor Don and their ministry and uh, continue to anoint them and bless them. And God, we love you and we just pray you continue to move in a mighty way in this church service. Use these tithes and offerings. Thank you for uh, the obedience and the people's hearts that, that give. And God, use this money to further your kingdom. And we pray and ask all these things in your name. Amen.
200 miles from home and still be home. And so I thank Pastor Don and the choir for that very much. Good morning, everybody. All right. And Pastor Rusty, thank you for that, that prayer, brother. I really, I really appreciate it. And Pastor Brett, thank you for the opportunity to let me stand behind the sacred desk this morning. And I always think it an honor and a privilege to be here this morning. So this morning, um, let us whisper a word of prayer, and we'll get started. You've dealt well with your servant, O Lord, according to your word. Teach me good discernment and knowledge, for I believe in your commandments. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. You are good and do good. Teach me your statutes. The arrogant have forged a lie against me, with all my heart, I will observe your precepts. Their heart is covered with fat, but I delight in your law. It is good for me that I was afflicted, that I may learn your statutes. The law of your mouth is better than me than a thousand, thousands, than thousands of gold and silver pieces. Father in heaven, we thank you for your love you poured out on us today. We thank you that you did not leave us to wander aimlessly. Through your word, you give guidance and instruction. But Father, we pray by your spirit that you will not let us become arrogant to think too highly of ourselves where we cast off the wisdom of the boundaries you set for godly living. By your spirit, give us the unction to delight in your ways. But as we open up your word, let us understand the height and depth of your love toward us as manifested in your very breath as revealed in the scriptures. Grant me now the ability to speak with clarity and boldness so that the light of the world, your son Jesus Christ, will draw the lost and build up the saved for the sake of your kingdom. Hide me now behind the shadow of the cross. In the name of Jesus the Christ, I pray, and let the people of God say amen. amen. Turn your Bibles to Romans 7. Verses 7 through 25, as we continue unashamed, a series through the letter of Romans. Please stand, if you're able, as we honor the public reading of God's holy word. Romans 7, verses 7 through 25. Read along with me in your text. It's on the screen. But let's read together. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? May it never be. On the contrary, I would not have come to no sin except through the law. For I have not known about coveting if the law had not said, You shall not covet. But sin, taking opportunity through the commandment, produced in me a coveting of every kind, for apart from the law, sin is dead. I, once, I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin became alive and I died. And this commandment, which was to result in life, proved to result in death for me. For sin, taking an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me, though it killed me. So then the law is holy, and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. Therefore, did that which is good become a cause of death for me? May it never be. Rather, it was sin, 
in order that it might be shown to be sin by affecting my death through that which is good, so that through the commandment sin will become utterly sinful. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold into bondage to sin. For what I am doing I do not understand, for I am not practicing what I would like to do, but I am doing the very thing I hate. But if I do the very thing I do not want to do, I agree with the law, confessing that the law is good. So now, no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh, for the willing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. For the good that I want, I do not do, but I practice the very evil that I do not want. But if I'm doing the very thing I do not want, I am no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. I find then the principle that evil is present in me, the one who wants to do good. For I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man, but I see a different law in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin which is in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, on the one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God, but on the other, with my flesh, the law of sin. You may be seated. On February 28, 1646, Roger Scott of Lynn, Massachusetts, was tried and found guilty of sleeping in church. <laughs> it is reported, after a long day at work in the field on Saturday, Mr. Scott fell asleep during Sunday worship service. The Puritan church at that time had men in the church who carried wooden staffs to thump people in the head when they fell asleep. <laughs> they were called tithing men. When one of the tithing men noticed Mr. Scott asleep, he was awakened by one of the tithing men who hit Mr. Scott on the head with a long knob stab. Well, the report states that Mr. Scott became angry and struck the tithing man back. This led to his arrest and he was put on trial. He was found guilty of sleeping in church. Now here's the kicker. He was sentenced to a public whipping. Now, aren't we glad that times have changed <laughs> and that law is no longer in effect? Now, one of our American founding fathers, John Adams, was once quoted saying, America is a nation of laws and not men. A nation of laws means that laws, not people, rule. Everyone in this church and everyone in this country are, are ideally governed by the same laws regardless of their social, ethnic, political, or economic status. Now, whether you're the sitting president or the former president, a member of Congress, a member of the Senate, or, the reg or a regular, ordinary layman, no one ideally is above the law. Now, this is true in the eyes of God, in a sense. No one is above the law. Yet, in a theological sense, what do we need to know about the essence of the law of God? I submit we will see this answer in our passage this morning. What do we need to know about the law? First, we need to know the law is good. The law is good. In verse 7, Paul asks the question, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Then he answers, May it never be. On the contrary, I would not have come to know sin except through the law. For I would not have known about coveting if the law had not said you shall not covet. The law does not equal sin. Now this is a rhetorical question. This is something, a style that Paul uses throughout. And it's the same style he used in the previous chapter. And in this section, he denies that the law is sin, yet he affirms that they have a theological relationship. He uses a personal example. I confess I would not have come to know sin except through the law. The law is good because it reveals sin. And sin is a theological mirror to our souls. Listen to these words from James 1, verses 22 through 25. Write that down. We'll read that when you get home. But it says, 
Prove yourselves to be doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in the mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. But one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, that man will be blessed in what he does. And here we're encouraged to do what the word says to do. We deceive ourselves when we hear the word and we don't do what the word says to do. James in verse 23 affirms the word is like a mirror. If a man sees himself in the mirror and does not act upon what he sees like someone who hears the word and fails to obey the word, see our reflection in the mirror of God's word is a call to obey what we see. The law in view here is the Decalogue in our chapter for this morning, specifically the Tenth Commandment. Paul says that he would not have known sin except through the law. He would not have known about coveting if the law had not said, you shall not covet. The word translated for covet is a word that means lust. It is a lustful desire for something. Here the lustful desire for something is wrong. In Exodus 20, verse 17 reads, You shall not cover your neighbor's house, so you not cover your neighbor's wife, his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. This same law is given again in Deuteronomy 5, verse 21. To covet is a, describes a desire for self, for self-satisfaction. And going through this passage, it reminded me of a time in our life that we... Eric and I, before we have kids, we bought a station wagon, assuming that we would immediately have kids. Eric said, okay, I need a station wagon. You got to point out where you're going to be in five years. We don't have any kids. We got two puppies, so, but we need to get a station wagon. <laughs> so I acquiesced. So God gave us kids, and they came fairly quickly. And we ended up having two cars because God gave us five kids, and there weren't enough seats in the car. <laughs> so that station wagon did me no good. And Erica couldn't really go anywhere by herself with the children. And I remember specifically that morning, I was getting dressed for work. And my neighbors across the street just bought this brand new suburban LTZ with 22 inch rims, cream color. And I was like, man. And something came out that was deep within me that I didn't even know that was there. I wanted that truck that specific truck and I didn't want them to have it. It shocked me. And this verse came back to me. I, if you would have asked me if I was a covenant person, I said, no, I'll just wait and wait and get my own. But not that morning. <laughs> it shall not covet. It's a desire for self, for self-satisfaction. Perhaps it's a mirror of the fall in Genesis chapter 2 and 3 where our foreparents were in the utopia, but it was not enough. Our parents, foreparents, chose to disobey God to satisfy a selfish desire. Here the law unmasked sin in Paul's own heart. In verse 8, Paul says the sin took an opportunity through the Tenth Commandment, produced in him coveting of every kind. Sin stirred up a lustful desire. And the quickest way to get someone to do something is to tell them not to do it. In other words, when we're told not to do something, it immediately stirs up something with us to do that the very thing we're told not to do. One commentary called it the forbidden fruit syndrome. Now, I've got four daughters and a wife, and they are my nutritionists. <laughs> Food watchers. I love ice cream. But as soon as they tell me I don't need another scoop of ice cream, you know what I want to do? <laughs> we're prone to rebel, church. In Exodus chapter 20, verse 4, the Israelites were commanded not to make idols for themselves. But by chapter 32, they did exactly what they were told not to do. They fashioned an idol, the golden calf. 
In verse 8 this morning, Paul says, apart from the law, sin is dead. But in verse 9, when the commandment came, sin became alive. In that same verse, Paul was alive, but he died. The thrust here is when Paul came into contact with the law, he understood he was condemned by the power of sin, but he was alive, but unaware of the consequences of sin in his life. Before we are saved, the law illuminated that we were spiritually dead. It is a reminder that the wages of sin is death. In verse 11, he doubles down. He says that through the commandment, deceive me and killed him. One scholar suggests that this is a reference to the nation of Israel who was deceived into believing that life was keeping them and keeping the law. And as we know, nobody's able to keep the law perfectly all the time. Nobody. In Genesis 3, the serpent used deception to, the, to encourage sin. Write this down, 2 Corinthians 11, verse 3, and 1 Timothy 2.14. Now, Paul offers a commentary in these verses on deception and sin played in the life of the fall of man. Go read those when you get home. But in point, here's the point spelled out directly in verses 12 and 13. So then the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. Therefore did that which is good become a cause of death for me? May it never be. Rather it was sin in order that it might be shown to be sin by effecting my death through that which is good so that through the commandment sin would become utterly sinful. The law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. The law and the commandment refers to the Mosaic law, the moral law. It has been noted that the law is holy because the one who gave it is holy. The law is righteous because the one who gave it is righteous. The law is good because the one who gave it is good. Listen to these words from Mark chapter 10 verse 18 and Jesus said, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. In verse 13, Romans chapter 7, Paul asks another rhetorical question. Did that which is good cause us death? The answer is again an emphatic no. The law did not cause death. It only exposed the deadly sin that was latent in his heart. As believers, we are no longer slaves to sin, but we still wage war with the presence of sin. And this good thing, the law, is used by sin for God's purpose to draw out the true essence of sin, which is really death. And as believers, what do we need to know about the law? We need to know that the law is good. We also need to know that the law cannot save. In this next section, verses 14 through 25, we'll see as good as the law is, there's one thing that it cannot accomplish. It cannot save. Yes, the law is good, but it has its limits. It cannot rescue us from sin. Yes, it is a guide of our responsibilities to God, but it does not have the power to free us from the bondage of sin. It telegraphs our bondage. But the law alone cannot break the chains of the unregenerate, nor sanctify the regenerate. Verse 14 says, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold into bondage to sin. Here the law is described as spiritual. One commentator noted it deals with the inner man. Listen to these words from Deuteronomy 10, verses 12 and 13. Now Israel, what does the Lord your God require you but to fear the Lord your God and to walk in his ways and to love him and to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and to keep the Lord's commandments and his statutes which I am commanding you today for your good. Here, keeping the commandments and statutes is an issue of the inner man. In our verse 14, the law is spiritual. It was the Holy Spirit who inspired the human authors. Paul affirms in 1 Corinthians 2 and 13, he says, Now we have received, not the spirit of the word, but the spirit who is from God, so we may know the things freely given to us by God, which things we also speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. The law is spiritual because the word is spiritual. Your old nature is of the flesh, and our old nature is contrary to the spirit, and the flesh wars with the spirit. In verse 15, Paul confesses, what I'm doing I do not understand, for I'm not practicing what I would like, like to do, but I'm doing the very thing I hate. In other words, Paul offers an explanation of verse, to verse 14. He says, his flesh sold him into bondage of sin, therefore he hates what he does. He wants to obey the law, yet his sin nature creates a tension. Here's a sense of frustration. And we too experience this same tension at times. 
There are times in our lives when we hate the very thing that we do because we know the law, yet we break it. And here, just knowing the law cannot guarantee you will be saved from disobeying. This week I was working on something and I just finished going through Psalm 23, how God will guide us and lead us. And I really trust and believe that. And there's something I'm working on and I had an original plan and that plan was best, but I got frustrated and tried to switch it around. And when the answer came back to no, I had to go back to the original plan. I got angry. Can you believe that? You don't tell me no, I tell you no. And I wrestled with that and I just got off with Psalm 23 about God leading his sheep. In verse 16 he says, but if I do the very thing I don't want to do, I agree with the law, confessing that the law is good. In other words, the fact that he is aware that sin contradicts law is proof that the law is not sin or evil and that the law is good and that he is not capable to perfectly keep the law all the time. That's us, church. And verse 17 again affirms the tendency of the human condition to disobey God. So now no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. He's not saying that he's not responsible for his transgression, but sin dwells within us and they can have a powerful influence in our lives. Verse 18, for I know nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh, for the, for the willing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. Here's a reiteration of verse 14. Our flesh is the problem. Our flesh is the problem. He's not saying that there's no good in him, but he's saying that his flesh is tainted with sin. Verse 19, for the good that I want, I do not do, but I practice the very evil that I do not want. It's a repeat of verse 15. Although he desires to obey, there is an internal struggle. This is true for you and is true for me. Verse 20, I'm doing the very thing I do not want. I'm no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. It is a repeat of verse 16 and 17. When sin controls our lives, it produces evil. In verses 21, 22, and 23, we reiterate the war, reiterate the war between our sinful flesh and the law. Verse 21 through 23, I find the principle that evil is present in me, the one who wants to do good. Again, evil is the, is the believer's old nature. Yet Paul wants to do what's right. If you are a believer, you trust in the death and burial and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, your desire, your changed nature should be to want to do what is right. 22 and 23, the internal war. For I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man, but I see a different law in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin which is in my members. The words translated joyfully means to delight in. He delights in the law of God, which is an expression of God's love and care for us, but yet our flesh serves the law of sin. Our members, our flesh, our hands, our eyes, our feet. It's war, church. But I love verses 24 and 25. Because there's wonderful news. There's wonderful news what the law can't do. It makes a glorious announcement through another rhetorical question. Wretched man, oh wretched man that I am, what, who shall set me free from the body of this death? Who? In other words, who rescues us from the grips of sin? It's not a what rescues Paul, it's a who. The law is a what. What can the law not do? The law cannot rescue it cannot save. The word translated wretched here means miserable. The law cannot save from the hands of sin. And when we are held captive in the grips of sin, we are miserable. Paul likens it to a body of death. The same language is used by Christ in Revelation 3, verse 17, to the church at Laodicea. Listen to these words. Because you say I'm rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing, and you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Some scholars have suggested in Romans that this verse is similar to a cry for help. Another suggests it's a cry for personal righteousness, a cry for deliverance. Who can deliver us from this body of death that sin causes from disobedience of the law? In verse 25, we get our answer. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. 
So then on the one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God, but on the other, with my flesh, the law of sin. The law cannot save us, brothers and sisters. It just can't. Jesus Christ, our Lord, is our deliverer. Our victory is in Christ. Listen to these words from 1 Corinthians 15, verse 57. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of our faith in Jesus, our minds are being renewed by the power of the Spirit through his word. But the battle continues. But we have victory even though we are being sanctified progressively. So what do we need to know about the law? That is good, but it cannot save. Thanks be to God, we have a Savior that delivers us from this body of death. The law illuminates our need for a Savior. Redemption is in Jesus, not the law. Only the redeemed can truly serve the law of God. Listen to these words from 1 John chapter 5, verses 4 through 6. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that we have overcome the world, our faith. Who is the one who overcomes the world but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. I heard the most disturbing thing this, this week from a theologian. And it speaks to the spirit of our age. This theologian was promoting that God does not have boundaries in creation and neither should the believer in terms of certain lifestyle patterns. It was a direct attack on the law of God. We live in an age where you have those under a Christian moniker that says anything goes. But that's a lie from the pit of hell. We were given the law because we were created with boundaries. If you break the boundaries that God has given in his moral law, life will not go well for you. Our passage this morning is important because according to some, the law is evil because it is not good. It, some say that the law is evil because it restricts our freedom. But until we accept Christ's redeeming work on the cross, we drag around that body of death. But thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord that he has set us free. And we ought to thank him. Thanks be to God for his good, for his love endures forever. Thanks be to God for we receive the kingdom that cannot be shaken. Thanks be to God for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds. Thanks be to God for one day he brought me up out of that pit of destruction. Thanks be to God that he brought me out of that miry clay. Thanks be to God he set my feet upon a rock and made my footsteps firm. Thanks be to God that he delivered me from the penalty of sin. Thanks be to God that I'm being delivered from the power of sin. And one day, thanks be to God, I will be delivered from the presence of sin. And if you are here under the sound of my voice and you cannot give thanks like that, don't leave this place or take another breath without looking in the mirror of his word. Because for we all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. But it is written, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So if you're not 100% sure, if you believe on his name, because things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard and which have not entered the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. What do we need to know about the law? The law is good. The law cannot save. But thanks be to God we have a deliverer in Jesus Christ. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceedingly joy. The only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion forever, both now and forever. And let the people of God say amen. amen. And if you've made a decision for Christ and you've never let anybody know that, that is the best news. And if you've made a decision for Christ and you've never been baptized, your baptism means going to the right side of your conversion. And God also assumes that you belong to a local fellowship which comes with other believers, brothers and sisters in Christ. 
and get in the garden and work diligently for his kingdom to lead others to Jesus Christ, but also to build up the brothers and sisters, edifying them through the gift that he's given you through the Holy Spirit by trusting in his name. Pastor Brad is going to be up front and he'll be able to receive you. But don't sit there. Because the law is good, but it cannot save us. But thanks be to God, we have a deliverer and a savior in Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I invite you to stand. We're going to sing the hymn, I Surrender All. things very quickly. Uh, I love that phrase that we just sang, make me holy thine. Uh, God, make me holy yours. Uh, everything about my life, that it be yours. We, uh, this morning, just, uh, a couple of announcements before we send you on to uh, Sunday school. Hope that you can stay for that. Thank you so much, Pastor Jeff. Thank you for that great word. Uh, thank you for delivering it and being the mouthpiece of God this morning to us. Um, this morning, uh, one of the things, we, we made some adjustments with our bulletin, and so you probably saw that. Uh, what's normally on a tear-out portion, uh, starting this week and next week, will be in the pew back in front of you. Uh, but wanted to, uh, to announce one of those things that's probably in that pew back. Uh, that's, that includes our uh, guest cards, our prayer cards, and uh, amen, our Wednesday night dinner reservations, right? Um, and so I uh, hope that you can join us for that, but they'll be in the pew back in front of you. Uh, one of the things that was in there this morning that you may have missed since it was in the uh, pew pocket is the uh, announcement about our flowers this morning. Uh, and they are in honor of a sweet couple, uh, Miss, Miss Rosa and Mr. Richard Lewis, and their 58th anniversary today, wedding anniversary. And so we... Miss Rosa, we don't know how you've done it, but... Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, we, we love you too, and y'all are so special to us, uh, both of y'all. And uh, so we, we, we love you and keep praying, praying for you, Miss Rosa. Uh, all right. Uh, it, you will probably see that our work has started in the uh, new children's building, future children's building right next door to us. Uh, so as you make your way to Sunday school, you're welcome to walk through there. Uh, if you walk through there with kids, do tell you, just be careful. Even, even if you got uh, wives, be careful with your husbands. Monitor them. Uh, there's some, if you go into the rooms, there's some loose outlets and stuff in there. Uh, but you can see some work that's going on, new framing and, and uh, restructure a little bit in there. Uh, but it's safe to walk through. Uh, you're welcome to, to, to uh, journey through there a little bit, check out what's going on. And uh, we are so excited about what's happening there. Uh, probably a good time, Rusty, one of, the, one of Rusty's ideas. 
um, was to uh, on some of the new framing in there. Uh, if uh, anybody is is uh, willing, and if God lays so lays on your heart uh, to go write uh, a prayer or a, a passage uh, on the on the frames on the studs, exposed studs in there before we cover those up. Uh, and so you are more than welcome to do that. Uh, we'll try to grab some Sharpies real quick uh, uh, right after the service. But if you'd like to do that after Sunday school, we'll have those available. Uh, or you can come maybe early this week uh, because they'll start closing those up pretty soon this week. Uh, so you can't wait till next Sunday because uh, we're not letting you write it on drywall. All right. Uh, but uh, if you want to write that on the studs, you can sure do that. Uh, but we pray for what's going to happen in that building and already been praying this week. Uh, for the lives that are going to be reached uh, in that new space. And so let me pray over you. We'll dismiss you on to, to small groups. God, we do thank you so much for the word that you've given us this morning. Uh, God, for using Pastor Jeff to deliver it to us. God, for the worship that's taken place in here. And God, we thank you so much for the opportunity now that we have to go and, and join with other groups of people as we continue to wrestle with your word and to apply it to our lives. God, to be molded and shaped uh, in our Sunday school ministry uh, by you and your word and the Spirit's work in our lives. Uh, God, we thank you for the reminder this morning. Uh, God, that what the law could not do, you did. You did with Jesus Christ, your son. God, thank you for offering salvation to all. And God, if there's anyone in this place that's not received that this morning, then I pray that they would not leave this campus until they talk to one of us and accept Christ as Lord and Savior. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. God bless and you are sent. Mm -hmm.